Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have Stefano Gennaro uh, from Polytechnic in Milano. Thank you, Stefano, for coming. Thanks. Stefano is a good friend of me and uh, uh, what I call a rock star of computer security. Uh, Stefano is a professor. He teaches computer security uh, in Polytechnic in Milano. And, uh, a very famous course which I discovered recently watched. They have a YouTube video which is watched by like, thousands of people from his course. So if you ever want to learn the basic of computer security, you can watch that. Uh, Stefan is also very highly engaged in computer security and research. He's a he's a member of the review board of Black Hat. If you don't know what's a Black Hat, it's the the leading uh, malware and computer security briefing where leadership of computer security comes in and trains other uh, professionals. Uh, it's, it's organized next to the DAFCON, which is another uh, leading computer security conference most of them. And Stefano has been a review board member and a speaker and uh, engaged with Black Hat for like almost 10 to 15 years now. Thanks for reminding everyone of my JJ. Exactly. Yes. And Stefano is also an entrepreneur. He has started three companies. Uh, the, the biggest one is Secure Network, which is responsible for going going through your network of different companies and making sure that your network is secure, which is clients like for the post office of Italy. I think a lot of big clients, and they have also in Melbourne and Milan. He has a ticketing company, and he has sort of started a recently a company on a finance sector for banks. And with that, I will have Stefano give the floor and talk about some hacking topics. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for coming. So um, thanks for the nice introduction. I'm much less than you made me sound to be. Um, and this talk is about uh, hacking robots. So um, it's partially based on a paper that you may have uh, or may not have read, which uh, was presented at Security and Privacy uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, um, we uh, also have continued working on the topic. So basically, this builds on, on, on the basics of that paper that you can go and read after the seminar if you are interested. Uh, and uh, um, I will touch on the new things that we have been uh, doing and which, has not, which have not been published yet. Um, of course, I need to acknowledge uh, uh, the people that actually did the work, which are my PhDs, former PhD students and PhD students, Davide Quarta, Marcello Pogliani, Mario Polino, and uh, my former colleague Federico Maggi, that is now at uh, Trend Micro, and uh, Andrea Zacchettino, who is uh, another associate professor at Polytechnico working on robotics, so a domain expert. Um, for those that are uh, more in the security space and not in the industrial robot space, such as myself, uh, brief primer on uh, industrial robots, crash course, uh, not literal crash, but you get the meaning. Um, so an industrial robot from the outside is uh, basically an arm that you can control and that can do things with an effect. But uh, uh, the uh, interesting part for someone like me is what is happening here. And that's actually how this paper got started. I was getting a, a cup of coffee with uh, my friend Andrea in his lab dog, and I saw that thing, which was controlled by that thing over there, which was closed. And I was like, hmm, what's inside there? Oh, we don't, I mean, we open it for maintenance, but we don't really open it. And as I was, uh, you know, putting my hackerish end towards the box, uh, my colleague said, you know, we are actual engineers here, so there's 380 volts flowing through that, so you may want to uh, stop for a moment, pause with, to think what you're doing, and actually let me take away <laughs> the power before you do that. So, after being saved, we looked into it, and uh, um, actually the um, architecture of this thing uh, um, turns out to be a very much a standard. So the names that you will see and the details uh, are related to the specific robot that I'm, I'm showing. But if you pick up another robot, even from another vendor, the organization of the architecture is going to be the same. And very much everything that I'm going to say with small changes applies across different vendors. It applies to ABD, which is a leading uh, vendor, it applies to Kawasaki, it applies to Komau, you, you name it. They all use more or less the same architecture. Actually, the reference architecture for this is even an ISO standard. So it's, it's a very, it's a ve everything is very, very simple. Now, inside here, 
there's uh, two computers basically. One is the main computer, that is the computer that you connect to from the outside. The other is called the access computer. And the access computer is basically a hidden embedded computer that performs some calculations. I will uh, talk more about it later. Um, then we have another computer that is outside, uh, that is, uh, uh, in, in the language of ABB, it's called uh, uh, um, teaching pendant. And it's basically a, a, small, uh, a small pad that you can use to move the robot manually. Um, so you pick up this thing. Uh, it actually has a dead man grasp, so you need to grasp it uh, in order for the robot to move. If you, leave, if you let it go, the robot stops. Uh, um, and uh, this is a Windows C computer. These two things uh, are two VIX works-based systems. Uh, um, the, uh, the whole thing is connected to a so-called drive unit, which is uh, the set of uh, uh, electrical systems that actually turn the commands into a power, uh, uh, into power given to the different motors of the robot. Um, and there's the panel board that you see here on the side, connected through a set of contactor units that bypass all of the computers directly to the drive unit. Which means that, for instance, if you hit the stop button, the stop button is going to take away power and to activate brakes, uh, regardless of what the computer is saying. And a set of other uh, devices in this box uh, bypass the computer system. And this is very important when we assess uh, what is the effectiveness of attacks against robots, because some things you cannot change uh, as an attacker, which is very good. So, um, why are robots so widely used in an in a, uh, industry? Well, the, the reason is that they can be programmed, right? And that's what you want the robot to do. You want it to do some specific operations over and over again, and to be very flexible, and you can do very complex things, things with them. And you program them by using a code. Uh, this is an example in uh, the code uh, that uh, ABB, the, co the programming language that ABB uses, which is called Rapid. But as you can see, it's a very simple English-like language. Um, it doesn't look much different from a version of C with, some, with a lot of built-in functions. And besides the built-in functions, uh, this uh, uh, language has also built in um, variables. Some parameters uh, that are built into the robot and some parameters that can be defined by you. And uh, um, by the way, as you can see, uh, someone can use the teaching uh, pendant to move the robot around uh, and even to create uh, workflows uh, and series of uh, if-then uh, things uh, in a graphical way. And uh, all programmers uh, switch uh, between this and this interchangeably. So you will have somebody teaching the robot the movements, uh, then going back to their workstation and refining the program, loading the program, refining it again with the teach pendant. It's, it's like this type of process. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, connection point is the fact that this can be run into an environment that for ABB is called the robotware, uh, that uh, uh, allows you to simulate what the robot is doing, also on, on, your, on your computer. Uh, okay, so um, I was saying that this code, if you look at it, it has a lot of parameters. Uh, some of them defined by the user, some of them implicit. Uh, what do you mean by implicit? By implicit, I mean that uh, when uh, you are uh, um, programming a robot, you want the robot to move the arm and reach, for instance, an object. Now, the controller needs to understand this instruction break it down into the type of movement that it, the robot needs to make, uh, and then break it down further into how much power, how much, uh, for how long I need to power up the motors uh, to reach that place. In order to do that, you need a lot of parameters that are not shown by the code, such as, for instance, the length of the arm or the weight of the arm. This condition how long you need to run the motor in order, or how much power you need to, go to give to the motor in order to move the arm. So the reverse cinematics of the robot is known, uh, and it is embedded in some parameters. Some of them are programmed by the users, but most are hidden. They are just inside the software of the robot. So there's a config file with all these parameters. And most of these parameters uh, are not even displayed to the users, because since the robots, for instance, do not grow once they leave the factory, 
yet. Um, the length of the arm is a fixed parameter. It will never change. Either you break the robot or the length of the parameter is going to be always the same. So there is no way for you to see this config file. Which is kind of interesting because from an attacker point of view, because if you can change the config file, the robot will miss its programming, even if the program is correct. And uh, since there is no way to see this file, the programmer will not have a clue why the robot is failing. Or uh, it will not, uh, there will be no way to tell that the, the, the robot is going to fail. The other reason why robots are so widely used right now is that they are connected. And they are meant to be connected. They are not just connected by chance. Uh, for instance, uh, this is a robot from Kumao that we have also in our lab. And uh, um, this is a piece of the manual. And it's a piece of a manual of a robot that has uh, uh, 15 years, I think. So it was already like this 15 years ago. This uh, robot uh, is uh, on this controller. There is an email server that is processing emails from the outside. You can send an email with instructions to the robot, and the robot will reply with the execution of the instruction. Now, think about it for a moment. There is only one reason to put an email server on that robot. Because for any other type of connection that is not connecting it to the internet, email is the most inefficient way ever to send and receive status reports. The only reason you put a main server there is because you want to connect this thing to the internet. Which, I must say, if I look at it, sounds like a bad idea. But, you know, <laughs> evidently it didn't sound like a bad, bad idea yet. Which is probably the most important phrase in computer security. Like, it sounded like a good idea at the time. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> as all security reviews, uh, we can start from the attack surface, from where the robot is connected to the outside. How is it connected to the outside? Well, there's a set of commands that you have uh, physically on the robot, including a USB port, uh, that is so forgotten that it's not even on the schematics of the robot. The flex pendant, of course. And then uh, you have a number of connections, uh, usually at least uh, two ports. Uh, one meant to be on the factory line to connect to other robots or other machines. Uh, and one meant to be a service, a service port. On the service port, you usually connect either with your laptop to upload uh, programs to the robot, or you connect, for instance, what is called a service box. A service box is a fancy name for a box with a VPN server and a GPRS modem, so that the uh, vendor can dial into the robot from remote to perform a maintenance or assistance. Um, this uh, Ethernet port, uh, which is the one on the factory network, uh, runs a set of services. The first service uh, is uh, FTP, the first and foremost service is FTP, but then there's another of other services. For instance, there's uh, an uh, endpoint for uh, web APIs uh, that are called the robot API, Rob APIs. And Rob APIs are ways to use uh, web services to uh, connect and give commands to the robot, because why not? Um, so right now, this stuff is mostly used for monitoring. It's actually mandated by an ISO standard that you have a, mo a remote monitoring option for robots. In the near future, but even now, uh, you can uh, integrate it uh, for uh, Industry 4.0 purposes, so integrate it with manufacturing, managing processes, so no and so on and so forth. You can also, in the future, imagine that there's going to be um, app libraries for robots, uh, um, such as uh, if you go to uh, robotappstore.com, uh, you will see an app library for domestic robots, uh, um, for consumer grade robots. In the future, it's not, it's not a secret, it's an, open, uh, it's an open thing in the industry that uh, uh, vendors want to enter the app market. So you will be able from the robot to download from an app store new procedures, uh, new capabilities for the robot and so on and so forth. All of this means that the robot is way more connected to the internet. 
So the first thing that we did uh, in our analysis was to try to assess the impact of a cyber attack. To assess the impact, uh, you need to reason on the requirements that the attacker may violate. Now, robots basically follow three requirements. Uh, uh, the first is safety. Uh, robots should not harm their operators. So for instance, uh, this is uh, our colleague uh, Federico uh, sitting in front of a robotic arm. Since uh, this uh, protected space, the cage surrounding the robot is open, uh, the robot is uh, uh, harmless. Uh, the robot uh, is, is just like if you had to push the red, uh, big red stop button. The robot cannot move. Um, and this is a typical safety feature. Typical safety feature to avoid harming somebody even unintentionally. Then robots, of course, have a goal of accuracy. Um, this is from a paper by uh, in a YouTube video from TU Munich, uh, where they programmed a robot to throw darts, uh, because of course Germans. Um, <laughs> for the useful things that you can do with a robot. Um, but that goes to show why robots are used in the industry. Right? One of the key factors is the fact that robots, for instance, can do a welding uh, by passing a number of times in the same exact same position without going out. Because sometimes these processes, if they are not done perfectly, they are not really, uh, they cannot really be spotted, uh, and they can create uh, faulty products. And finally, a robot uh, should not uh, do this. This is an unfortunate robot of NASA that has uh, performed too many operations in too short a time and has caught fire. Now, um, let's, let's take a minute to thank the robot for his service. Now, uh, safety, accuracy, and integrity are uh, the requirements uh, for robots. Uh, so, um, violating any of these requirements uh, uh, via a digital vector is what is a robot-specific attack. In other words, uh, when we attack a robot, uh, we attack the computers. But in order to go beyond a computer attack and to get to an attack that actually affects the robot, we need to make the attack affect one of these. And I have, uh, we have uh, uh, developed an entire threat model, and we'll just show a couple of uh, examples. Uh, for example, uh, the control loop alteration, which is an attack against accuracy. If uh, the attacker is able to modify the config file that is not shown and not manipulable by the uh, operator, the operator can load whatever code they want on the robot and the robot is going to misbehave in a way that can be catastrophic but that can also be very very subtle i have an example and let's see if i can show you the video like, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure that I would have internet connectivity, so. Um, but we can see it from here. So this is, a, this is our robot, and it's actually performing a welding task. Only instead of using a welder, we are using an iPad with a pen, so that you can see what happens. So this is the program, it just goes on the same, the very same line a couple of times. And that's an important task. It must be performed with critical precision because that's the reason why you use the robot. Because you cannot spot any micro defects in this. So now we launch the attack. Of course, you don't see anything because attacks are very silent. The program is unchanged and the robot executes a second time. Now, you cannot see anything. And in reality, if you inspected the robot, you would not see anything out of the ordinary. You can inspect it as long as you would like. But the behavior of the robot now is this. If you can see, it's oscillating uh, around the line. This is an oscillation of 2 millimeters, and it's willingly limited. It could be 8 centimeters if you wanted. But this is so limited that this is what is called a micro defect, a defect that you cannot really spot, uh, and which makes uh, the use of the robot uh, not really uh, that useful at all. Now I will get back to my presentation, maybe. There we go. 
So um, the impact of this micro defects has not been shown by us. It has been shown in uh, previous research. This is a research for uh, some uh, colleagues at Ben Gurion uh, that uh, have showed uh, the impact of a micro defect in 3D printing, in particular in 3D printing of the blade of that very unfortunate drone over there. This is the drone. <laughs> These are two pieces of the blade that are separated because of a one millimeter defect in the 3D printing. So if, you, if a robot gets it wrong even by one millimeter, which is not easy to see, you can create a critically flawed, uh, a critically flawed component, which of course uh, is then going to be used in automotive, in avionics, uh, in any number of critical industries. By, by manipulating the parameters, uh, you can also affect the integrity of the robot. We have shown uh, through simulation, because our colleagues in the automation engineering department were not very keen on us destroying a, a 80,000 euro robot, that uh, um, by making the parameters completely insane, uh, we could break the robot. For instance, by making the robot hit repeatedly against the end of line of the, of the engine uh, movement, uh, um, this can lead to the destruction of the robot, which is a very important and significant thing because you cannot buy robots uh, uh, off the shelf. They have a lead time in delivery, and uh, some of the production lines that are robotized uh, have, co have downtime costs uh, in uh, the tens of thousands of dollars per minute. So um, that's a significant possibility of doing damage to an enterprise. Um, finally, by tampering with the production logic, so by changing uh, the code while it is uploaded, if there is no integrity control of the code here, you can, of course, change what the robot does, but that's kind of the most straightforward and obvious attack. There's another attack that we were worried about. It's trying to figure out something that would affect safety. Now, safety is very difficult to affect in robots because since an attack and a fault are very similar, there are safety features in robots and in their deployments that will prevent most attackers from being able to affect the safety of people. For instance, uh, however, we were able to affect something that has a safety uh, result. For instance, um, the operator is supposed not to approach the robot uh, if the robot is in the motor on state. Uh, this is uh, so strictly enforced uh, that there's actually a physical key that you need to turn uh, in order to go from motors off state to motors on manual state to automatic state. If the robot is in automatic, it will execute the program. If it's not in automatic, it will only move uh, if you grasp the, the change pendant. If it's in motors off state, it will not move, period. <coughs> so, operator is, the operator is safe as long as, it do as they don't approach the motor, the, the robot, uh, if it has uh, motors on. However, if we are able to manipulate the signs that tell the operator if the robot is safe to approach, uh, that may fail. Now, of course, uh, the operator, in theory, is supposed to control the physical key before getting to the robot, not to watch what the robot is saying, what the lamps or what the sign is saying. But most operators do not do that. They look at what the instrument is telling you. So since the, um, since the uh, teach pendant shows here if the motors are on or off, uh, most operators will approach the robot uh, if the teach pendant says that the motors are off. However, since the teach pendant does not really check the libraries that it's using for displaying this, uh, we were able to modify the libraries uh, and to make the teach pendant say that the motors are off uh, while actually the motors are on. If you go into a different uh, portion of the panel, uh, you can see that the uh, uh, robot is in, uh, is in auto mode. So it's not just on, uh, but it's going to move at its full speed, uh, executing its program regardless of where the operator is. So this is a potentially safety critical uh, thing, uh, which is not totally safety critical, because uh, the safety regulations say that the operator needs to check the physical key. But they don't. Also, in theory, robots are, as we said before, deployed in protected spaces. So 
in order to approach the robot, you would need to open a cage. In order to open the cage, you would stop the robot and put it in, in motors off state in any case. Which is true, but not all robots are deployed like that. Uh, so for instance, we had this message while, after our uh, first research. Uh, and uh, uh, it was from uh, somebody from a research lab. And they were said, yeah, so we, we have a robot deployed in the lab. And instead of having the, the actual physical fence on the perimeter, we have a red line on the floor uh, that shows uh, how long the robot can grasp. So whenever we use the robot, you just step out of the red line. So we had uh, everything turned off, uh, and the uh, computers and everything were powered off. Uh, and at some point, somebody in the IT department decided to do a port scan of the network of the, uh, of the uh, research lab. They port scanned also the network where the computers controlling the robot were deployed. Those computers had a wake on LAN feature. So when they were port scanned, they turned on. When they turned on, they reverted to the last state, and the robot just swept all of the space with the arm. And uh, I am writing this email because I was outside the red line at the moment this happened. Because this happens, because those guidelines are guidelines, they are supposed to be followed, but it's not necessary. If they are followed, however, they kind of stop the possibility for a tracker to do harm. This is true now, but uh, uh, in the future, robots are going to be collaborative robots. Uh, so there's not going to be a protected space. Uh, they are going to be close to humans. And uh, collaborative robots are very safe to use, uh, and they are very gentle. If, if you ever interact with a collaborative robot, you will realize that if it even just touches you, it's going to stop. And it's designed to uh, have a uh, speed at the terminal element uh, that is such that even in the worst case that the robot does not stop in time, it cannot have an energy sufficient to actually harm you. It will be unpleasant because you will get a smack from the robot, but it will not harm you. However, since we are, I suppose, most of all engineers in here, you know that the terminal, the, the velocity of the terminal point uh, is the product uh, of all the velocities and angular velocities of all the engines on the robot. Now, you can build each engine so that it's power limited. But the combination needs to be power limited by software. The fact that the robot stops when it feels resistance uh, is a software security measure. This is a hardware security measure. You cannot hack this measure. Well, you can hack it with an axe, but <laughs> technically. But uh, you cannot really hack into it. But this you can hack into. So when you move from here to here, software security becomes critically important because at that point, software security is the finger between the human and getting harmed. Which is a software engineer I find very scary, but that's another story. So um, I've just shown what the attacks are. What is the gory detail of how you compromise the controller? So let's uh, get back to this attack surface. Uh, and we started from here, from the LAN port. Now, on the LAN port, uh, there's uh, an FTP server, as I said. And uh, this is the main computer that you talk to. It's a VX works based machine uh, with an x86 processor. Whereas instead, the access computer is another VX works machine uh, with a PPC processor. Um, the teaching pendant is a Windows C uh, machine. Um, the, one of the first things that we wanted to figure out is this. Whenever a robotics engineer programs a, a, a robot in the simulation environment and then connects to the robot, uh, they don't just upload the program. They also upload all of the uh, firmware images that they use for the simulation. Why? Because you want to be sure that the code is going to run in exactly the same environment. But they only connect here. How do they update all of this? Evidently, these other computers need to somehow fetch the updates. So we wondered, how do they fetch those updates? And we found that at boot, each of the components logs into the FTP server and downloads 
whatever it needs to run. With it's FTP, it's not FTPS, uh, but it's on the internal robot network, so it should be fine. Except that this FTP is the same FTP that is exposed outside, it's bound on uh, both ports, but that's going to come afterwards. The interesting thing is that none of these components uh, check any signature of this software. Now, it's, 20, it's 2019, uh, my phone checks signatures of software that I update uh, when I update Angry Birds. Uh, so I would expect uh, a robot that weighs half a ton and costs 80,000 euros to actually check. Uh, I won't go as far as saying that the code is actually signed from ADD, but at least that it is code and not a bunch of zeros, I would expect that to happen. Instead, the robot does nothing of the kind, so it just downloads whatever it is there, slams it into memory and executes it, whatever it is. Which is not a great idea, but then we wondered, uh, this is FTP, right? What credentials are these computers inside using to connect to FTP? Hard coded credentials, maybe? It wasn't hard coded credentials. It's just slightly worse. What's worse than the coded credential, you ask? Well, the fact that for the first five minutes after you boot the robot, the authentication system of the robot is disabled, so any credential is an administrative credential. You can type any login and any password, and you get into the robot with full administrator privileges on the inside and on the outside. Wherever you see this sign, it means that there is a vulnerability patch for this, uh, for this thing that we found. Now, we had another question about that. And the other question was this. If all of these things get rebooted and downloaded their firmware from the FTP, how do they actually get configured? They are computers, they need some parameters, right? Some, some configuration stuff. And auto-configuration is obviously magic. How does it actually work? Well, it's not magic. It works through the same FTP server. By getting uh, files in this uh, slash command directory, that does not actually exist on the operating system. It's a virtual directory, a little bit like could be slash proc on uh, Linux. But it's handled inside the FTP server, which means that the guys at, FTP, at uh, ADD have rewritten their FTP server from scratch. Uh, but that's another story for another day. And then uh, you get these files, and in these files there's the information that the robot needs to set up. Nice. What happens if we write in those files? Well, what happens is that you reconfigure those parameters. Uh, and if this was not enough, uh, there is a special file, slash command, slash command. Whatever you write in there is executed on VxWorks uh, in the main computer, on the operating system with administrator privileges. That's another vulnerability, of course. And so you can, for instance, uh, store a command that uh, say something like uh, uh, register this IP address that I gave you as a remote service box. And you would ask, why is that important? Because anything that comes from that IP address is considered as coming from a trusted maintenance device, which was not exactly what they should have done. Uh, but also, you can execute commands uh, on the underlying operating system, such as saying, oh, you know that user authentication system that you have? Just turn it down. We don't need it. Then, since they have rewritten this uh, FTP server, we looked curiously at the, at the functions. And this is how the code of those functions look like. It's a straightforward uh, buffer overflows, as if it were the 90s. They made me feel young again. And uh, um, of course, it's a buffer overflow on the stack. VxWorks does not have stack uh, address uh, layout randomization. It does not have stack protection. It does not have non-executable bits. Uh, so it's really hacking like in the 90s without any, uh, without any form of protection. 
there's other stuff that we found that will not uh, the, uh, will not um, bore you to the tears, like with uh, the fact that uh, the robotic APIs uh, uh, have uh, um, you know unauthenticated uh, uh, endpoints, so you connect to the API, you just send it a message, and nobody asks you who you are or what you want; it's just executed. Uh, there's a uh, sanitized use of things like string copy over and over. So it's, it's like it's like an enormous mess of vulnerabilities. Uh, um, but the the mm, takeaway of the story is that uh, inside the robot we found that memory corruption vulnerabilities that really should belong in the 90s. Logical vulnerabilities uh, like uh, they were raining uh, and. Uh, um, Basically, lack of isolation. All of the components blindly trust the main computer. The main computer blindly trusts some other elements outside. For the first five minutes of the, 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 the booting of the robot, uh, everybody trusts everything without checking anything. So there's a generic assumption that these things will never be deployed in a, uh, in a no-side environment. The internet is a no-side environment. So, um, these robots are not really designed thinking of being deployed on the internet. And so you can do a complete attack chain because uh, using the state, uh, the, there's, there's also a thing that I don't have on, uh, on these uh, slide sets uh, because it has been corrected, so it's uh, stupid to bring it up over and over again. But basically, when we started working on the robot, I, I mean, I'm not a robotics engineer, right? So I did what every engineer usually does. I read the handbook. I read the handbook, and at one point of the handbook, that was written, hmm, Yes, the controller, the, the robot, uh, has a default user, name default user, with a default password, robotics. The default user cannot be disabled, the password cannot be changed, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I, I, I finished my research paper here, <laughs> without even touching the robot, I finished it, I'm done. So, this was taxed and removed in subsequent versions, so I, I didn't put it on the slides, but because it's unfair. But um, the point is that there's a static, that, that's another example of, of blindly trusting the environment that you are in. We have a login and a password, but we don't actually use them, because they are known, they are put on the label, on the sticker. So, you can use those static credentials, but now there's not static credential anymore, but you can just do an FTP put of a command, uh, or uh, you can go to the robot uh, APIs uh, that are not authenticated, or uh, you can exploit the robot APIs. So, so you can get access to the main computer in a number of ways. Once you have access to the main computer in any of the number of ways that are there, and there's more where they came from. We, we didn't find them all. We found a number. Now, you, what you can, so the fact that you can get into the main computer is not really amazing. I, I mean, it's a basic result. It, having seen and, and penetrated computers for the past 20 years, I tend to assume that given enough time and enough will, a computer will be penetrated. But what happens afterwards is important. That when you have penetrated that computer, you just need a command to disable the user authentication system forever. And then, uh, by, by just putting, uh, uh, for instance, a malicious DLL in a certain position, at the next reboot, uh, the, um, the DLL is going to be loaded into the uh, teach pendant. And this means that you have achieved persistence, uh, in the malware sense of the word, uh, on a Windows computer that is never going to be inspected because it's an embedded teach pendant. You cannot really look at the common line and, and go and run an antivirus on it, and this malicious library is going to stay there, and it's going to be connected to the internet and be able to call home, so you have achieved complete permanence on the computer forever. And that's basically unfixable. The only way that somebody has to fix this is to A, reflash the robot because they just have a, uh, in, have a sudden illumination and reflash the robot, or B, hacking to the robot themselves to see what you have done. Because there's no way from the command lines to have any clue of what is happening inside, which is a typical problem of most embedded devices. It's not a problem that you can hack into them. It's the problem that to figure out that they have been hacked into, you need to hack into them yourself. 
Also, if you were wondering, uh, all of those configuration files that contain the safety critical parameters have been protected because they realized that they were, uh, they were safety critical and also some of those parameters are actually industrial know-how, so they need to protect it from uh, uh, competitors because they explain their control loops. Uh, there's a lot of know-how in that. So they encrypted these files uh, by obfuscating them, XORing uh, bitwise with a random key. And the random key is the name of the file. <coughs> And that's how the attack that you saw before is implemented. It's exactly this, uh, it's exactly this set of uh, problems. So what's the attack surface uh, for the robot at the, end of the, at the end of the day? At the end of the day, it's three parts. There's the, uh, there's the network part. There's uh, uh, the physical uh, connectivity, the physical connections of the robot. So you can basically use a USB key or whatever else and connect to the robot locally. But there's also another part of the attack surface that we have not explored in, in full yet. You remember that I said that they are using domain-specific programming languages. Now, as we all know, domain-specific languages are kind of mean because you need to check how secure they are. How secure is a language? So. Without even diving into the details, uh, I will just tell you an anecdotal piece of evidence that will, uh, will let you understand why I think that the domain-specific language is actually one thing that to, to look closely at. So, in Rapid, the standard way for a robot programmer that wants their robot to interact with other robots on the same, uh, um, on the same uh, network to do it, is to open a socket. Not in the sense of generally opening a socket. No, no, literally using the socket function as you did in C in your first program in the programming language courses that you did once and never did again because you did that for an experiment and then there's libraries on top of libraries on top of libraries wrapping that for you. No, no, in Rapid, they open a socket, read byte by byte from it, Pass uh, what they received by by right from it, and you can only imagine how well they pass that stuff, uh, and slam it into the memory of a thing that weighs half a ton and can kill humans. Program domain specific programming languages are not, to put it mildly, well designed from a security point of view. They tend to make, I mean, a, a security, a, a program language cannot avoid you making security mistakes, sorry. But some languages brings you, bring you towards a secure code, and some languages bring you away from it. C brings you away from it. You need to know what you're doing in order to obtain secure code. Rust or Go bring you towards it. You need to know what you're doing in order to make your code unsafe. Since we are talking about uh, humans that normally program robots and they do not think about security, we want uh, domain-specific languages to be of the last type. Things that bring them towards security, and then if they are knowledgeable, they can get away with something unsecure. Not the other way around. Unfortunately, it's precisely the other way around. Which is a major problem, because you can change the architecture underlying the robot, but changing the language is going to piss off an amazing amount of customers. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So if we want to make it happen, we need to make it happen now because most robots are not a network program. If they start building code with their industrial production processes, with network code inside, we are never going to get those functions removed. If we want to do it, the time is now. So, you may wonder how often then um, robots are exposed to the outside, because that's a legitimate question. Because otherwise, it's wasted 40 minutes of your life if you're not getting back uh, with talking about very theoretical vulnerabilities. Fair. Well, even just logically, if you think about it, all of these robots have a controller that is exposed to the outside. It's on a VPN, but that's already exposed. 
Most of these robots are connected to the internal network of a factory and in the industry 4.0 paradigm that we are so strongly pushing, they are going to be connected to the rest of the world. In fact, I don't know about Portugal, but for instance in Italy there are uh, um, grants for companies to turn uh, their, uh, their production into industry 4.0 ready stuff. And the condition is uh, that your machines need to be internet reachable. <laughs> Honestly, I would have written that differently if I were. Because you can understand that in Italy that means that everybody is going to slam like an Ethernet port anywhere in order to get a grant. So, and I'm sure that Portugal is more or less, I mean, we are more or less in the same mindset. So, um, so why people slam internet connections in their machines? We, 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 we wonder how many people had already done that. So we went and we, uh, we sought uh, using a uh, uh, showdown that I think you probably know. It's a search engine that allows you to search for connected devices according to certain parameters like ports, uh, protocols, banners, and so, uh, things like that. We did a, ser a search uh, and we found uh, tens of robots easily identifiable, remotely reachable. So there's not too many. It's 28 robots too much, but it's, uh, uh, there's not too many because many industrial systems are behind the industrial routers. Mm? We don't know which industrial routers are actually robot connected because we didn't go into the routers and see what is on the back. But there's a, a, we found about 85,000 routers very easily and there's probably more. 5,000 of these have no login and password. So they are connected to the internet, they are shielding their uh, factory network with no login and password, so they are not shielding the network at all. So, but even when they are uh, um, shielding the network with login and password, um, they are all trivially fingerprintable. Most of these industrial routers have very verbose banners, uh, so they, they go beyond uh, brand name and model name. This is a typical example of a banner. You have the serial number, you have the software build version, you have the ARM BIOS version, and all sorts of information that do not really belong into the first thing that a, that a router tells you when you connect to it from the remote. This thing should say nothing. It should, should wait for you to say the right magic words to it. Um, so what we found by analyzing these routers, and uh, we didn't have to reanalyze the routers, because we, like out of 12 vendors that are there, major vendors, uh, Seven and all of their firmware available, and all of the firmware that was available was easily reversible. So we analyzed the firmware, and we found that they have uh, outdated applications, outdated libraries, including the crypto libraries, outdated kernel. So when I started my career in security, one of the first machine I managed 22 years ago, and a kernel that was an old outdated kernel as was 1.394. I still remember it because it was gave me the nightmare for the first six months on the job. One of these routers had a 1.394. So it had a 22 years old kernel running on the internet facing guard strongly protecting the industrial network. But then it doesn't matter, because this is the, from the uh, web uh, interface code of one of these shits. And uh, um, it's a piece of code that is probably not very readable, but basically it takes the, it's PHP, which is already a very bad sign. Uh, it takes the request, uh, picks up whatever is in the get parameters, uh, slams uh, it into this variable, and just uses it without any filter. So if you ask me what is the vulnerability of this piece of code, uh, the answer is very easy. All of them! This is the entire collection of vulnerabilities in one page. And so, at some point, with a sudden, you know, those, those genius strokes, um, Federico Maggi uh, pasted these into the source of all wisdom, Google, and we found that this code had been copied and pasted from a blog post by an unknown author saying how to create this type of API with PHP, which had been deleted afterwards because even the blog author realized that it was bullshit. 
But this is still there. This page has been deleted in 2008. We found this in 2016. This software has been there for eight years, exposed to millions and millions of attackers outside and pretending to defend networks on an industrial router that costs uh, 2,800 euros a piece. And it's just a shitty router with this thing on. Now, of course, uh, when you find these type of vulnerabilities, you responsibly disclose to the vendor. And as you have seen, uh, for ADB, for instance, uh, there were all the vulnerability patches, right? The, I, I, I pointed out the vulnerability patch code. In fact, ADB has been amazingly good. They responded to, they have a one single unified uh, security contact with a dispatcher. They responded to us within 24 hours and identified the problem with their team within five days. And the only thing that they were worried about was our timeline for disclosing because they tried to let us understand that it was not like pushing a patch on, uh, on the software. They needed time to, dis to distribute the patch to their uh, users. We gave them almost nine months and they were very active. And that's it. That's how it's done. Now, this specific vendor, we contacted in a number of ways, including searching all of the employees on LinkedIn and reaching out to them one by one. And we did not really get a response. Then, then when we published, <laughs> <laughs> then, then when we published the first report on this, which was by Trend Micro, then we published the paper on security and privacy, and then this was presented uh, in an extended version of Black Hat. When we published the report, they reached out very angrily to us, <laughs> saying, hey, how comes we didn't did they get a notification of this? And we sent them like the whole chain of emails, and we were like, outside of brute forcing email addresses for you, we have tried every possible contact, so sorry. But hey, we tried. Silence. We were like, oh shit, here comes the lawsuit. It didn't really come the lawsuit. We went to security and privacy, presented, went to, and it got on everything. It, it did this research, we ended up on uh, MIT tech review and, and so on. So, so it, it ended up on, on newspapers, so you couldn't really forget about it for a while. And then we go to Black Hat. After the Black Hat presentation, the CEO of the company pulls out from the, from, the, from the crowd, comes to the stage, shakes hands with all of the others, gives us his business card, and then goes away. The router is still unpassed. There's no patch for this. So that's the reason why you don't see the info on the router on these slides, because we decided to just omit it. <laughs> because, you know, is this still unpassed? There's thousands of these routers out there with this code on their out, uh, publicly facing uh, authentication system. So that's the two polar opposites, ABP's reaction and this guy's reactions. Um, there's a physical attack surface. The fact that uh, basically in order to put these programs on robots, uh, most uh, programmers will use uh, USB keys. Uh, uh, which creates all sorts of issues. I mean, you can ask the Iranians about their nuclear program and how it goes uh, after Stuxnet, uh, and Stuxnet propagated uh, exactly with this. Stuxnet was a malware designed uh, to disrupt the nuclear centrifuges in Iran. And it propagated precisely because of this, because even if you unplug the robots from the network, uh, those USB keys are going to get infected in the laptops that people use on the internet. And then this helps the, the malware or the attacker jump your, uh, your encounter. If uh, this happens in a nuclear processing facility that creates uh, uranium for weapons, uh, it's going to happen uh, on the Smith & Sons uh, small medium business uh, companies network as well, of course. Oh, and uh, this was the, the other thing that I was saying. Uh, uh, since domain specific languages do not really make filtering of inputs or uh, connection to the network easy to get right, uh, that's another area of focus uh, for our research. How do we make this happen? 
So in conclusion, uh, robots are increasingly being connected to the internet. They already are, and they are more and more. There is an industrial robot specific class of attacks. So you, d you don't just have the usual computer attacks. There's things that you can specifically do to industrial robots that are different. Fortunately, these attacks have a high barrier of entry. So if they are uh, totally within the reach of any motivated attacker, but not of any you know, general purpose attacker. That's because they need the robot. And we were able to do this because we have the robot. And that's still a cost barrier. But it's not enough to deter a, a determined attack. There are some vendors that are very responsive, which is the positive side. The negative side is that some vendors are not very responsive, but they give you the business cards. <laughs> and uh, um, we need to push hard for countermeasures because not all the vendors are aligned uh, on the need for countermeasures. What are the countermeasures? Short term, we can just do deployment hardening, which is what most robotics vendors are actually doing. In the medium term, they can do system hardening, such as, for instance, you know, checking signatures and updates, these type of things that have been around for 20 years. In fact, uh, for instance, ADD is doing that on the next generation of uh, robotware, and Kumau is doing that on the next generation of their uh, controllers. So the industry is moving in that direction, but it's going to take a little bit of time. And long term, we think that this needs to end uh, into the standards, because uh, robotics is a standard-driven industry. If it's written in the standard, it's getting implemented. If it's not written in the standard, there's a very high probability it doesn't. So uh, we, had, uh, we got in touch with, uh, for instance, ABB, with FANUC. They are going to push for these to be uh, included into new standards. Uh, but uh, uh, I keep saying this in seminars, because of course, uh, many of us get involved in, uh, in uh, standard committees. So if you end up in a standard committee for robotics, uh, think of me and try to push for putting cybersecurity inside those requirements. Um, that being said, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please reach out uh, either by email or by Twitter, and uh, now we will take questions. If you want to see the original paper, the slides, videos, uh, there's commentaries, there's some follow-up work, and robosec.org. Thank you very much. Good question. Yes. So you can start doing attacks uh, based on the firmware, for instance. But since uh, the machines inside uh, are uh, uh, running typically VxWorks, uh, uh, they are difficult to emulate. Uh, and uh, the emulators that you found uh, are not really full emulators, but they just uh, emulate the behavior. Um, in order to test exploitation, for instance, in memory exploitation, you actually kind of need that hardware. But aside, aside from that, uh, a lot of the logic vulnerabilities, for instance, yes, you don't uh, need the physical robot to test. Um, for, the, um, for the vendors of uh, industrial routers, this does not hold. It, it just by looking at the firmware, you can, you can basically do everything because they are basic hardware devices. So you can just use an ARM board if you need to check uh, how the exploit is going to play out in memory. But, uh, um, but you don't need the physical device. For the robot, we found that for the memory exploitation, you actually kind of need uh, the device because the layout of VxWorks is difficult to predict. Uh, and also, by the way, the one of the barriers uh, of entry is learning how VxWorks works. Because uh, automation engineers use VxWorks, QNX, and other uh, real-time operating systems. But in um, uh, security courses or security labs, we tend to focus on Linux, Windows, on, on common operating systems. And hopefully many attackers also have more skills on those than on real-time operating systems. So there's a barrier. But it's, I, I agree that it's not terribly high. It, it's not high for, an, for a targeted attacker that wants to do that. If somebody works uh, on industry... What's that? Somebody curious, for example, I remember the guy who attacked the Swedish national security system and, because, and they saw that they were secure because they are using these big IBM machines that nobody knows. Well, yes, but so they have 400 sort of people that know. They, like, I don't know, $200 and 
get you know with the yeah um, I found that uh, um, in particular we, we worked on these works but uh, GNX I think is the same they have a lot of things that are very different uh, from uh, regular uh, non real time operating system yeah. so it takes but it takes time for the attackers to learn okay. So one thing that uh, um, came to my mind, I mean, first, uh, thank you for your, you know, on one side brilliant, on the other side uh, scary presentation, so we are all thinking that, you know, we will probably die when we pass by a robot next time. <laughs> uh, and I'm particularly worried because I also work with some of them, and so I will think twice when I come closer. But then the, the question is actually, how frequent is that? Because has it happened? So we, there's a clear potential for it happening, right? So the thing is, is it happening and being covered and we don't know? So or that's, is it not really happening and we, by chance? That's an exceptionally good question and also one that is very difficult to answer. Uh, so I cannot answer it uh, directly for robotics specifically, but I can answer it for industrial control systems. Uh, so we, we don't have a statistic for it, but we have anecdotal evidence that this happens uh, and this is happening uh, more and more. Uh, we have some anecdotal evidence that is uh, common knowledge, uh, um, the attack uh, on a Ukraine uh, power system, uh, the attack uh, on a German uh, steel mill in 2014, uh, that are, they are public knowledge so they can be discussed openly. But there's a number of others that are not public knowledge and, and that are known in the community. So there's uh, anecdotal evidence that this happens, but the real problem is what is the risk of that happening, which calls into question how often that happens. So um, my answer to that is twofold. Um, basically, I would divide between uh, uh, economically motivated and non-economically motivated attackers. So for economically motivated attackers, the answer is simple. It's going to happen when it is more economically viable than other types of attacks against companies. So, for instance, in our paper, we discussed the scenario where uh, an attacker uh, blocks production and demands a ransom. That's a viable possibility. And right now, they are not doing that because they block uh, a company's, for instance, SAP system, which is much easier to do, and uh, demand a ransom. If, uh, in the future, the economics for this change are tilted, because, for instance, companies get slowly better at defending their information on the IT side, the OT side becomes a viable, uh, a viable scenario. So th that's kind of the answer. It's, it's, uh, it's based on economics. The non-economically motivated attackers are harder. So in an industry that has a strategic value, so where a non-economically motivated attacker is likely, it's very difficult to answer how likely it is for it to happen. And uh, it's also a very difficult case because in that case, well, normally what you, what you need to do is make the attack more costly for the attacker than the potential revenue. For the non-economically motivated attacker, this still that you need to figure out a way to either make the attack not possible or uh, create all safeguards in order for it to be as, as, as little damaging as possible. And this without caring about the budget. So for most companies, this is a, loser, a losing game. It's a game that you don't, you don't even play. You don't even play because there's no way of winning. So uh, focusing on the economic attackers, which is where companies should focus because that's the game that they can play, um, I would say that for the moment there's not an really immediate danger of that being used because there's more, but that's just because there are zero way to arm companies. Uh, but it's going to go there. Um, it's going to happen also earlier, I think, in other sectors such as automotive, for instance, like uh, um, ransomware on automotive devices is going to be, to be viable economically soon. And when it's going to be economically viable, it will just happen. Like uh, all other attacks before, before that. So. so everything you said about industrial robots could be said about autonomous cars, right? Probably. Yes. yes. There's, there's significant differences, but there's also significant analysis, yes. Mm -hmm. exactly. Any more questions? Okay.
to thank the speaker again. Thank you.